As Ron said, we're going to start a new little kind of mini series called School, talking about some areas of the school that relate to life. You would be surprised at how many of those you can find. See, I remember walking through the doors of the cafeteria on my first day of middle school. The sights, the sound, the smell. Because for some reason, all school cafeterias have that distinct smell to them, don't they? And I can guarantee you, you're not going to find that scent bottled up in a cologne or an air freshener. Because that cafeteria smell alone might be enough to trigger a lot of anxious memories come flooding back. Do you remember what it was like on your first day of school? With a food tray in hand, turning to face those tables. Or maybe for you, it was walking into the lunchroom with your sack lunch in hand and just praying to God that you would quickly find a familiar face to sit with. Now, you may not have prayed a whole lot as a middle school or a high school student, but you probably prayed then (laughs) because the cafeteria can be one of the scariest places on earth. As students, if you're a student now, or most of us were students at one point, we likely all feared that stigma of having to sit and eat alone. In fact, some of you might even be breaking into some cold sweats right now, just even thinking about it. As human beings, we all, we all have these basic needs. You know them. Food, water, shelter. But the argument can be made that our need to be accepted and belong are actually at the top of that list. And if maybe you might be a little skeptical of that here this morning, well, I bet that if I were to play a game of would you rather with our youth students in the room. And I were to ask them, would you rather eat alone in your school cafeteria or would you rather not eat but do so with a table full of friends? Well, my guess is that they're probably going to forego the lunch to be with friends every time. Oh, the school cafeteria can be such a haunting scene to us, even to this day. Because a couple of our greatest human needs are acceptance and belonging. It's why so many people today can probably share stories of maybe poor choices made or bad paths chosen because they were chasing those two needs in their life. You know, it's also why approval and rejection are a couple of the most powerful forces in the world. But imagine this with me for for just a moment. Imagine yourself once again as a brand new student Standing in the cafeteria with your food tray in hand, scanning the tables in a bit of a panic. The cold sweats are beginning when someone suddenly calls out your name from across the cafeteria. They wave you down. Come sit with me, they say. I've saved this seat for you. Now, how'd that make you feel? In that moment, 
You may not have been able to name it, but what you were feeling was hospitality. It's a word that actually comes up often in our Bibles and in the New Testament letters. We're instructed to show it to others because it's a virtue that reflects the heart of God for all people. Hospitality is a word that literally means to love the outsider or the stranger. And in New Testament times, it was most often seen and practiced by people opening their homes to strangers who had been traveling long distances. Now that sound may sound a little crazy to us today, right? Like a good way to find yourself in your very own real life horror movie, probably. But before the time of Holiday Inns and Motel 6s, well, it was the original way to Airbnb. Because staying out on the road after it had gotten dark was normally a dangerous proposition. And so people relied on the hospitality of others to let them stay in their homes, to even share a warm meal with them. And the early Christians relied heavily on hospitality. The hospitality of others as they would travel and they would minister from town to town, of course, sharing Jesus with others. And Jesus did so as well. But then Jesus also showed this form of hospitality that was unlike anything the people in that culture had ever seen before. You see, he widened the definition of hospitality far beyond what a lot of people were really comfortable with. And that was especially true for the Pharisees, the religious leaders whose greatest criticism of Jesus all throughout the Gospels was really that he always associated himself with such extreme outsiders. Those who were considered to be the furthest away from God. And in a culture that regularly reduced people to categories and labels, when the cancel culture was just as alive and well, well, Jesus showed the kind of hospitality that said, everyone's welcome. You see, he would use his influence to lift others up. When the game that was normally played was trying to associate yourself with the people, that would increase your own status and popularity. You see, popularity may win high school, but hospitality wins life. And so Jesus would show hospitality by dining with tax collectors by giving time to prostitutes, by having conversations with Samaritans, by healing people who were considered to be unclean because of illness or deformities. Jesus extended the privilege of community to those who had no standing to expect it. Oh, and that could clearly be seen when when Jesus chose to begin his teaching ministry by choosing the 12 disciples, whom none of the other rabbis even wanted on their team, but Jesus, he made them like his first round draft picks. And I'm pretty sure that when people saw a tax collector like Matthew, or a messed up fisherman like Peter following Jesus, well, the message probably would have rung very loud and clear. 
everyone is welcome. And if you couldn't tell that by the people that Jesus chose to hang out with, well, you certainly would be able to tell by what made Jesus mad. You can, you know, you can always uh, tell what people really care about by what makes them mad. And one of the few scenes in the Bible in which we get to see an angry Jesus is when he went to the temple during Passover before heading to the cross and there, well, he found such a lack of hospitality that he just couldn't tolerate it. It's found in Matthew chapter 21, just a few short verses in verse 12. It says that Jesus entered the temple and he began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And he said to them, the scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer. But you, you've turned it into a den of thieves. That's my Jesus. And the thieves were the temple priests who were running this scam that was really kind of robbing people of the presence of God. Now to help you just picture the scene a little bit, I'm gonna show you a replica on screen of the temple. What it would have looked like in that first century. This is a picture model that can be found in the Museum of Israel right now. And you can see sort of the, the neighboring Jerusalem homes all situated behind it just to give you a sense of the scale of the impressiveness that the temple would have been. And at the center of it there sits the tallest building, the main sanctuary, with then a couple of inner courtyards situated around it. And the inner courtyards were accessible only to the Jews. And even at that, certain Jews. The rest of the open space that you see around it was the outer courtyard called the court of the Gentiles. And it was the area of the temple where everyone was welcome to come and worship. It's also the place where the animals for sacrifice were sold, where the money changers would set up shop, which wasn't necessarily an uncommon sight at all, but their pricing was very unsightly. And Jesus recognized it as a way for the priest to pray off of those desiring to be close to God. You see, they had made it one of the least welcoming places an outsider could imagine. The temple priests, they had taken a page from the playbook of the, you know, the local movie theaters, who of course had the signs hung, no outside food or drink. Yeah, the priests figured that if they didn't allow outside animals for sacrifice, well, they could set up their own concessions. <laughs> and you know how that goes. Where you're paying four, five times the price. And so when people would show up to the temple with their animals in tow, well, they would have to be inspected by the priest quality control. And the priest would inevitably claim the animal to be blemished. <clears throat> Sorry, unqualified for sacrifice. And the person would then be pointed to the concession stand where there were plenty of animals there qualified 
for sacrifice that they could purchase. And the blemished animal that they had brought was then taken by the priest and it was set aside. And then it would be put out the next day at the concession stand where it would be bought by the next sucker who had come to the temple with his own animal, blemished, of course. And our response to such a scam as this, what might be to cheat the system that's been cheating us. And that's when we begin to conceal a bag of candy flattened in our pocket, (laughs) a bag of our own popcorn hidden in the purse. A full Taco Bell meal, drinks included, stashed underneath our winter coats. (laughs) Maybe that's just my family growing up. I don't know. But you get the idea. You know, you find a way to stick it to the man. But in that first century, well, good luck smuggling in a goat underneath your jacket. (laughs) Or even maybe a dove in your purse. You see, the people were just stuck (laughs) paying the temple prices. They also didn't have any option of taking their spiritual business elsewhere. There was no white city they could make the short drive to to pay the half-price tickets You know what I mean? You see, worship was thought to be tied to the temple because it was the only place where the sacrifice for sin could take place. And if it was God's presence that you desired, well, that was thought to be tied to the temple as well. It's where his presence was said to remain in that inner sanctuary they called the Holy of Holies. The priests had quite a monopoly going. And to fatten their wallets even more was the fact that they had made a policy essentially saying, your money's no good here. You see, every... Jewish person was required to pay a yearly temple tax. And the priests wouldn't accept any other form of payment other than the Jewish shekel. The only problem was, most people didn't just carry around shekels in their pockets. It wasn't the the everyday currency that was used, which was predominantly Roman. Roman coins is how people would normally go about their business, how they would buy their groceries on a daily basis. And so in order to pay in shekels, well, the people would have to have their coins exchanged by the temple money changers. And no one was happy with that exchange rate. Especially the foreigners who would come and they would receive an even worse rate when they pulled out their foreign currencies. It would be a little like us here requiring our regular attenders to pay a certain amount in order to worship with us. And we made the stipulation that you could only pay in Swanson bucks. Yeah. (laughs) Now you would say, Swanson bucks? Who's got those? (laughs) We do. We've got plenty of them. We'll exchange them for you, you know, 50 Swanson bucks for $100. Oh, and you can see how worship begins to get pretty expensive. It was the kind of scam that the priests were running. They had turned religion 
into business. They were selling salvation to those who could afford it. And so Jesus comes in and boom, flips the tables. Because the temple was supposed to be a place of hospitality where everyone was welcome, where even the outsider who had been far from God could easily draw near to him. In fact, we could even say that that was Jesus' main mission here on earth, to make it easier for people to get to God. And once Jesus had made this huge, disruptive scene, disrupting sort of the business as usual in the temple, it says then that the kids all running around the temple begin to sort of applaud and sing these songs, sort of rooting Jesus on. It got very noisy, and the priests, they kept to themselves. It says that they began plotting who they could hire as a hitman to take out this Jesus fella. And it was in the middle of all of that sort of chaotic activity that it then says this in Matthew 21, 14, that the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Now this was another sort of subtle stance that Jesus was making in defense of the outsider. Because the blind and the lame were the people who would have felt as the biggest outcasts of that society. You see, they were likely Jewish, but still outsiders, relegated only to the outer courts of the temple because of their disabilities which in that day and age was often thought to be caused by the parents' sin or the sin of generations past. But once Jesus healed them of those disabilities, of that sickness, that barrier that had always been preventing them from being insiders was suddenly removed. Oh, man, can you imagine that? And the lens of Scripture doesn't follow these people after they were healed. But if we were able to watch their documentaries, oh, I would imagine that we would be able to follow them as they moved from that outer court, then through the the big limestone uh, beam the columns on the side that marked the entrance into the inner court of Israel. We would see the expression of joy, of awe written all over their faces because they had suddenly now been given greater access to God's presence. Jesus had removed that barrier that had been making them outsiders so that they could now be insiders. And he has done the same thing for us. Paul even tells us in Ephesians 20, verse 13, once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. You see, we were all outsiders with God because of our sinful nature, which acted as like this this barrier between us and his presence. Our sinfulness couldn't mix with God's holiness. But Jesus has removed the barrier He did that when he went to the cross, when he made made himself a sacrifice for the sin of humanity, making way for our forgiveness. And so now God, we can be with him 
in his presence because he no longer sees or counts our sins against us, but he only sees the righteousness of Jesus within us. It's why with Jesus, everyone's welcome because nobody's perfect. See, the scripture makes it pretty clear that when it comes to sin, everyone is an equal offender. We're all equally in need of God's grace. It's because of this that uh, one of the, the greatest daily prayers I have found to pray is this. So far, Lord, I feel, I feel that I have done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been grumpy or nasty or selfish. And Lord, I am so thankful to you for that. But in a few minutes, God, I'm going to have to get out of this bed. Oh, and then I'm going to need a lot more help. Amen. Now, maybe you resonate with that kind of prayer as well because you understand your need for God's continuous grace in your life. And it was this misunderstanding of need that actually led Jesus in the Gospels to constantly be pointing this condemning finger towards the the Pharisees. And Matthew 23, 3, even saying, hey, do as they say, because they actually knew the scriptures really well. But he said, don't do as they do, because they assumed that their moral goodness to sort of take the place of the grace that, of course, everyone else needed. They may have agreed in theory that nobody's perfect, but they figured that they were as close as you could get. They thought themselves to be the most deserving of being an insider with God, which led them to feel such offense when Jesus would extend a dinner invitation to outsiders who were far, and I mean far less deserving. One such dinner party, in fact, takes place in Mark chapter 2, where it says there that Jesus ate with tax collectors and other notorious sinners, it says. We can only imagine. And the Pharisees' response in verse 16 was, why does he eat with such scum? Now remember, you can tell a lot about a person by what makes them angry. And they were upset with Jesus showing this kind of hospitality because, you see, they wanted it to be them who was being honored. They wanted to be acknowledged for their insider status, for how good they believed themselves to be. And Jesus seen straight to their motive. In Mark 2.17 says, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I've come to call not those who think they are righteous, he would think, but those who know they are sinners. You know, the only barrier that God can't remove in our hearts from drawing nearer to him is the one that we have constructed in our pride. I mean, if we don't see our need for Jesus, our need for healing in life, well, man, God can't do much with that. 
He can heal anything in our heart except for pretending. Pretending that maybe we're all good or that we're good enough will always keep us as outsiders looking in. When we instead acknowledge our need for Jesus, it's because of God's hospitality towards us that everyone's welcome because nobody's perfect and anything's possible. Now, maybe even as I say that, some kind of impossibility in your own life comes to mind. Maybe it's a a problem that doesn't seem to have a solution, a situation you're forced to endure. Maybe it's something that needs to be said, but it feels impossible to say. That was the case with the husband who very sheepishly said to his wife one night over dinner, sweetheart, I, I have something to say to you, but I don't know how to say it. And she said, you can, you can say anything to me, just, just say it. He said, I need you to pass me the Worcestershire, Worcester, wor- that word is just impossible to say. You know, the sauce. Or maybe for you, what's impossible is saying, I forgive. Maybe it's something like, I'm sorry. Maybe for you, it's a relationship that feels impossible to, to, uh, to restore. Or it's an addiction to overcome. A mistake you are still but can't find yourself redeeming. And Jesus says in Matthew 19, 26, he says, listen, 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 listen. He goes, hey, some things are impossible for man, but nothing is impossible with God. And do you know he's proved it? It's because if Jesus can take us from darkness to light, Oh, if he can take us from death to life, well, then there is no diagnosis too dire. There is no situation beyond hope, no relationship beyond repair, nothing that is too far lost to be found. And we don't always know what God will do in a situation, but we know what he can do. Oh, he can breathe new life into something that has even been proclaimed dead. And with God in our life, we are never without hope. And so we have hope of salvation. We have the hope that all things work together for our good and God's purposes, Romans 8, 28. We also have the hope that God will use us in the lives of others as he advances his kingdom here on earth. In fact, I want to share with you another little but strange verse, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2. It says, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. Now, if you were to ask me to explain that one in any depth, I would tell you, (laughs) I don't know. But what I can say is that anything's possible. You'd never know what might be possible through a simple act of kindness or love done towards a stranger or an outsider, a foreigner. God would even remind his people of this time and time again back in the Old Testament. 
He had even written this one in their law. In Leviticus 19.33, it says this, Do not take advantage of foreigners who live among you in your land. Treat them like native-born Israelites and love them as you love yourself. Remember that you were once foreigners living in the land of Egypt. Now, God would do this time and time again where he would remind them often not to forget that they themselves were outsiders. Don't forget what it feels like to be that foreigner, to be that outsider, that kid in the cafeteria who's standing there with his food tray. The cold sweats beginning, feeling Like they've got no place to sit and no one to be with. And so God would remind them often so that they would never lose sight of his grace in their life. And when they would be focused on this amazing grace that God had given them, moving them from outsider status to insider, well, they would always be more likely to extend that kind of grace to others, to the foreigners. It's why Israel's original promise was that they would be blessed by God so that they could be a blessing to the whole world. Or if you wanted to put it another way, you could say this, that God showed them incredible hospitality so that they could show hospitality to others. And that is true for us in our lives as well. That the more we stay focused on the grace that is available through a relationship with God, well, the more likely that grace in our lives gets extended to the lives of others. It is through hospitality. You know, there are a lot of people that will probably never open up and read a Bible, oh, but they will read us. They will get a glimpse of our God through us. And popularity wins high school, but hospitality wins life. Hospitality is both this practice and a posture. We can, of course, experience God inwardly. But we can also experience God through the outward expression of hospitality when we make a point to show love and kindness to another person. The Christian author Henry Nouwen once wrote this of hospitality, that hospitality is making space for people who we don't have to make space for. It's showing love to someone, really with no strings attached, no agenda. Because hospitality isn't really about changing a person. It's simply about giving them a space where change can take place. Because you never know what God may choose to do. If you're a follower of Jesus in here or maybe online, my challenge even this week would be to practice hospitality. To a stranger, maybe to an unbeliever, maybe to someone who's a bit of an outsider. It may mean that you make space for them, maybe at your dinner table, or maybe it's in your schedule. Maybe it's in your thoughts or prayers, and you would convey that through a text or a a phone call, maybe a conversation. You can place that practice within the context of your own life. And we would do so, well, because... We never know what God will do. Oh, but we know what he can do. 
And then hospitality is also this posture towards God in our life. The worship team can come on up. It is this posture that involves us humbly admitting our need for Jesus. It is us coming to him, confessing our sins so that we may be able to receive and rest in the grace that he has made so available to us. It is this focus on the ongoing hospitality that God has shown us. Remembering as God would remind his people that we were once outsiders. Far from God. But he's made a way to remove the barrier. To make way for forgiveness of our sins so that we could draw near to him. Maybe this morning, whether here or you're online, and today would be the day where you would receive that hospitality of God for the first time, where today would be your day of salvation. It is still, it is the same, this, this posture of hospitality, where you would come before God in prayer, and you would do the same where you would tell him of your need for him and you would confess your sinful nature to him. And you would say, God, I need you in my life. And you would invite God's presence to be a permanent fixture as you would fix your life on him. Because everyone's welcome. Nobody's perfect. With God, anything is possible. Lord, we thank you that you take messed up people, outsiders like us, and you welcome us to draw near to you not because we deserve it, but because you have removed the barrier of sin, that you have allowed a way for forgiveness. And because of that, Lord, in our life and in your kingdom, anything's possible. Oh, we can take something as small as a mustard seed and it would grow into something incredible. Lord, would you do that with us no matter where we might be in our relationship with you, whether we're years or decades along, or maybe today would be the first time that we would accept your hospitality towards us. But may we never lose that posture where we would receive and we would rest in your grace. And so Lord, even just during this next worship song, we would do that. Lord, as many of us might take communion and remember your sacrifice for us, others might sing the words on the screen, Lord, may we rest in your grace. May we accept your love. We don't get it. Oh, we don't understand it. But Lord, we we take up that posture of hospitality before you. Say, I don't deserve it, but thank you for it. We love you, Lord, in your name. Amen.